Hey there, I'm Pete Berry, Senior Product Manager with Sanomatic, a leading provider of automated CIP and COP systems, as well as sanitary components. Today I'll be discussing how you can take some of 3A's existing standards, like the general requirements and the CIP accepted practice, and apply it to COP, or clean out of place parts washing equipment. We'll first take a look at traditional COP parts washers, but then quickly dive into another COP technology, uh, which is cabinet washers, such as the one behind me here, uh, which has much more in common with traditional CIP systems and design and operational practices. So this is a traditional COP parts washer where in your process parts are taken out of place from the process, often pre-rinsed to remove large soils, and then put into the COP usually with chemical and elevated temperature water where the soils, a bulk of the soils are removed. The parts can be removed from the bath and then rinsed and often sanitized with a, say a peroxide or some kind of sanitizer before being put back into the system's process. Now many GR requirements from 3A can be taken into consideration when ensuring a COP parts washer is designed to the latest sanitary standards. Simple things to look for such as tri-clamp process connections on any of the piping uh, within the recirculation system of the COP are an easy first step. Uh, but you can also look at the internal design. So is the process fabricated uh, according to sanitary standards? So a common method of turbulence within the COP is using what's called side jets. And I'll turn them on in a second here so you can see the agitation. Uh, but what we're doing is really creating a rolling general turbulence so all the parts get cleaned inside here. Uh, this particular COP, we have a row of side jets on this side as well as that side. So I'm going to turn the system on here in a second and you'll see that agitation in action. So in this next section, we're going to basically take an inside look at what this side jet design is. You can see one of them on the side here. Uh, we're going to take a cutout view and see how the design uh, can be designed to the E2 joint section within GR. So uh, crevice free, uh, cleaned welds, no cracks and crevices. Uh, we'll take a look at that next. So to orient you a bit before we dive into the design details of these two uh, COP side jets, what we did is we took a jet and basically sliced it in half. So we're seeing the internals uh, of a side jet, good and bad, um, similar to what you would do if you were to take, uh, say, a 3D model and cut it in half and look at it. Uh, so the unit on the left would be the example of a uh, bad hygienic design, a bad joint. Uh, the unit on the right would be the example of a good design. So if we start with the unit on the left, um, you probably see where it's apparent where uh, the welding and design and fabrication of this unit left some, um, some crevices uh, in this area where uh, the side jet tubing meets the actual side jet. So this would be uh, the COP tank inside. This is what we call the side jet area and this would be that tubing supplying it. Uh, in this case, uh, just a round bar uh, would, be, would have been taken with the drilled hole in the center and uh, that drilled hole uh, was matched up with a drilled hole in the tubing and th those two were uh, welded together. But you can see in this case, the, the weld obviously penetrated on the outside, uh, but it does not make a full penetration and you're, end up, you're uh, left off with the uh, crevice you see on the, on the left hand unit. Uh, not a good thing, hard bridge for uh, potential bacteria and other uh, issues. Unit on the right, um, different design. So this, this side jet is a machine piece and you can see that obviously uh, it was transitioned to a little larger uh, pullout uh, style hole on the side jet, uh, two beam manifold. So in that case, you did a nice clean weld uh, just like you would have processed two beam weld and uh, that nicely transitions into the uh, more narrow machined jet which then goes into the COP uh, tank itself. So now we'll take a look at some applicable sanitary requirements from the CIP accepted practice and compare those to a cabinet washer. In the 3A accepted practice, Appendix K flow rates details out some recommended flow rates uh, to ensure adequate CIP, which you'll hear is the minimum velocity of 5 feet per second, which can be translated into a, a GPM flow rate depending on your line size. Uh, what, now what that typical velocity does is it allows complete CIP uh, coverage within the process tubing or piping that you're cleaning. 
Um, so it's getting to all the nooks and crannies within the, a T or a, a branch or things like that. Uh, similarly, on a process tank that you're cleaning, uh, whether it's using a static spray device or a rotary jet uh, spray, um, there's recommended flow rates for those type of devices too to ensure you have adequate uh, spray coverage and cascading action down the sidewalls of those tanks. Uh, now for cabinet washers, it's a little bit uh, different of a game. Uh, there's no magic number, five feet per second or a certain flow rate per circumference of, uh, of uh, vessel uh, tank size. Um, but what we're looking for in cabin washers is just complete spray coverage of whatever parts uh, that you're taking out of your process and putting into the cabin washer. In this case, we have a, a cabin washer that's a rack on cart system. Um, so this rack actually rolls into the cabin washer and the various process parts get cleaned within it. Um, so in this case, we can use a, a variety of different spray devices to ensure complete coverage on these process parts. Uh, in this case, we have some rotary fluid driven type sprays within the cabin washer. Uh, we could also have static sprays or other types of sprays within the cabin washer itself. Uh, but we can also custom design uh, different spray uh, manifolds within the rack too. So in this case, uh, if I lift up some of these trays, you can see some static spray balls within the process piping on this rack. Uh, whatever spray device uh, methodology en ends up being used, again, the name of the game is complete spray coverage. So we want to get complete spray coverage throughout these parts, uh, whether it's these totes up top, uh, the buckets on the back here, the waste scale parts right here, uh, the process fittings, elbows, clamps, um, filler pistons, various parts on here. Uh, we want to ensure complete spray coverage on this system. How do we do that? Um, you can obviously have your parts soiled and go through a wash cycle. Uh, there's also something called riboflavin testing where you can ensure uh, spray coverage. So that's another alternative solution uh, to ensure that complete spray coverage within your cabinet washer. So now looking at the inside of the cabinet washer, uh, and talking a little bit about materials of construction, there's a CIP accepted practice section C materials, which walks through some various material construction requirements and uh, recommendations, uh, including the need for stainless steel and elastomer and thermoplastic type materials. Um, so in this case, cabinet washers are no different than that. You're using 304, 316, so 300 series stainless steel uh, for the general construction. Um, but also there's usually a lot of rotation of, of spray arms and door gaskets and things like that. Um, so I'm going to take off one of the spray arms here uh, and show you the rotary hub in this case is made of some thermoplastic materials um, as well as our door. So door gaskets or door uh, shields like this uh, are often going to be rubber type materials. So you want to make sure those are, are food grade safe uh, as well as uh, compatible with your process material because we're going to be washing that process within the cabinet washer. Uh, but also compatible within the chemicals that you're using for your cabinet washer as well. The 3A accepted practice, Appendix H, cleaning and sanitizing examples section, walks through a typical CIP procedure which can include pre-rinse, chemical washes, post-rinses, and sanitizer steps. Cabinet washers, when using a PLC controlled system like many CIPs, can go through these steps automatically and repeatedly just like in CIP. Let's walk through how the cleaning phase's critical tap parameters, time, action, chemical, and temperature are controlled. First, with a PLC controlled system, each of the steps washes can be set to a given time and repeatedly controlled. So hitting start on this HMI uh, prompts a fill step. Our cabinet washer is being automatically filled with water. And after this fill step, once it reaches a certain level, we're gonna go into that pre-rinse step, which as you see on the screen, will have a certain time value. In this case, you can see that the time of 15 seconds was set for this pre-rinse step, and we're counting down from 15 seconds, and after that 15 seconds is done, we'll go on to the next step. So similarly, the rest of the uh, cabinet washer cycle will go through a repeatable uh, time-controlled phase step uh, using this PLC of the cabinet washer. So the next variable intact is action, and you can see some uh, action going on in the cabinet washer right now. About 200 GPM is being thrown at the parts through the rotary sprays. Uh, so this uh, flow and pressure is provided by our centrifugal pump. Uh, right now we are switching over to the active rack. So there's about 150 GPM uh, being flown through the hoses, cleaning the ID of the hoses, uh, among other parts and sprays on that active rack side. So various ways to provide action for this cabinet washer. The next variable intact is chemical. In the case of CIP, a lot of times we're automatically adding in chemical uh, via dosing pumps or some other method. 
and controlling that chemical level, uh, either at a tie-in injection rate or perhaps with a uh, uh, conductivity type sensor within the, within the CIP system. On the case of this cabin washer, no different. Uh, we're, gonna we're gonna see the chemical pump turn on and then it will be dosed to an automatic level via a set point with a uh, conductivity type sensor. So the last variable up tapped is temperature. And in this case, on this system, we have an electric heater. Uh, that electric heater enables us to heat up to temperature uh, as well as maintain temperature of the solution uh, of a certain, say, rinse or caustic wash temperature. Um, this is also paired with a, a RTD type temperature sensor. Um, so obviously we not only want to heat up, but know when we're at, uh, say, 120 or 130 or 140 Fahrenheit, whatever temperature you may be at. Uh, another common heating method besides electric is steam heating. Uh, whether it's used with a direct steam injection or shell and tube heat exchanger, uh, often a more efficient and faster way of heat up as well. Okay, so wash cycle complete. As you can see on the HMI screen here, uh, we went through a full wash cycle and in this case our parts are clean. Uh, is there anything else we need to do at this point? Well, the answer is yes. We need to make sure that uh, we're also recording the data that we just uh, went through in our cleaning cycle. Um, so in this case, tying it back to 3A, uh, accepted practice for CIP, um, there's a section F layout and engineering requirements and that states that the mechanical cleaning unit shall be provided with a recording thermometer or similar device to adequately evaluate the cleaning and sanitizing regimen. So in this case, uh, how do we do that for a cabinet washer? So again, like a CIP, um, a lot of times you can have a chart recorder uh, mounted to the system somewhere uh, and those chart recorders are recording the uh, analog values, uh, the critical ones such as the uh, concentration of the chemical or the temperature of the wash cycle. Um, so that's uh, certainly one way you can do it. So another way besides chart recorders is through uh, data loggers. And these are available uh, either on local systems or even cloud-based, online-based systems. In this case, you're, you're basically tying into the PLC, the automated system. And after each of those cycles, you're packaging up uh, the clean cycle data and uh, recording uh, important param parameters such as the cycle ID, recipe name, uh, who ran the actual system, the operator name, any alarms, start time, stop time, all those critical parameters, uh, but as well as temperature, conductivity, uh, things like flow rates and pressures can also be recorded, as well as the recipe steps. Um, so what happened during the recipe, what kind of pre-rinse wash uh, steps occurred, uh, as well as uh, cycle events data and even comments. So operator or quality people can uh, comment through certain uh, interfaces for reporting. So oftentimes this is overlooked, but just as critical as the actual cleaning itself, uh, recording that you did clean and the, the important parameters were met. Hey, thank you for watching this 3A video blog installment uh, that wraps it up. Hope you learned a little bit more on how you can take some of the GR and 3A accepted practices and apply it to COP cleaning, whether it's COP parts washers or cabinet washers, uh, and make things a little bit more sanitary. Thanks, have a great day.